Hello, loved ones. Welcome, subscribers. Welcome, new subscribers. Thank you all for liking, sharing our video, supporting the channel. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My name is Revin Penelope Stewart. Um, I'm coming here with the book review today. I know I'm so sorry. It's been so long. I've been very busy trying to expand my business and keep in contact with myself and take care of myself and keeping myself grounded and centered uh, and charged every day. And so I finally got done with this book. I had a little time. So I said, hey, I'm going to come here and do a book review. And so today I'm doing a book, a book review on Kabbalah, the key to your inner power. Now, I read this book 20 years ago. I was so um, moved by it. You know, it, it shifted my consciousness because I was really, I had not had heard nothing about Kabbalah or the Tree of Life or the Sifrits or anything like that. And knowing that we had these aspects inside of us and that we could um, use these uh, these archetypes inside of us to reach our higher self and ascend uh his book was awesome for that it was my first read was awesome and then when i read it again a lot of other things jumped out at me because i've learned so much on my spiritual journey so i was re really able to decipher more information in this book um that the author really tried to hide I was like, oh my gosh, they're trying to hide this. And I talked about this because the spirit shared a lot of this stuff with me. Uh, but then there, there's some good, F, uh, good information in here as well to help you open up your chakras and keep yourself grounded uh, with some rituals. My favorite ritual I like doing that really uh, helps you tap into that mysticism is the le lesser banishing ritual ritual and the middle pep pillar exercise that I do uh, to keep my chakras, keep my spirit charged every day and keep my mind uh, open to seeing things from other perspective and, and taking control of myself, of my emotional state. So I do recommend that if you never heard of the lesser banishing ritual or the middle pillow exercise, do a little research on YouTube. There's a lot of videos on that showing you how to do those exercises. I do them at least, you know, uh, at least about four or five times a week, especially when I have to communicate with people and go out into public with people. Uh, keeping my spirit charged and protected is very important. So there is a ritual rituals you can do for that to keeping yourself grounded in the spirit. Uh, as well but I thought this is a very interesting book do I recommend it I don't you know I got mixed feelings about recommend I recommend it if you are going to be using this book to uh, learn more about your inner power because it's good in that but the historical information in here I would question I want to say that and I, when I get into this book discussion it, it will make a little bit more sense because I'm going to have a little discussion on the things that jumped out at me and the things that I learned historically that this author is pretending like they don't know. But I find it very hard um, that you don't know because the information is out there. OK, so let me start. This book is it's got 10 chapters in it. It's about 230 pages. Uh, there are some prayers in the back of the book. Uh, that can really help you tap into those energies within you and start centering yourself and charging yourself every day. So this is a good book to uh, start getting your chakras uh, together. Um, let me start from the... I'm going to start from the introduction. I like the pictures in here too. Let me show you the picture. I like the pictures. You know, it's very interesting pictures. You know, uh, and you know what? This reminds me so much of this Jordan Boss that I talked about in one of my videos. And the author kind of talks about that a little bit too, how the patriarchs come in contact with this jaw, this 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 uh, God that could be named, I think, Jordan Boss in here. I think they mentioned this in this book, and I thought that was uh, I have it marked somewhere, but this uh, book is such a long read, uh, so read it slowly. You know. So you can uh, absorb the information. But the author talks about this in the book. Her name is Elizabeth Claire Prophet. 
And this book is called Kabbalah, The Key to Your Inner Power. And I'm getting ready to read the introduction. If there is a common ground among the world's religion, it is to be found in mysticism, adventures of the spirit. The mystics have dared to push beyond the boundaries of orthodox tradition to pursue a common goal, the direct experience of God. Mystics long to see God, to know God, to be one with God, not in the hereafter, but here in the here and now. And they teach that while you may seek him in a, in temple or mosque or church, you must ultimately find him in your own heart. In Kabbalah, key to your inner power, I bring you a unique interpretation of Jewish mystical tradition known as Kabbalah. Through the inspiration of mystics who have gone before, I would remind you of the birthright as sons and daughters of God. That birthright, which is your unique portion of God himself, is right inside of you. Only you can unlock it. I, I was just... When I first read it, I was like, oh, my gosh, we have the power of God in us. You know, I was just so blown away when I first read this book 20 years ago. What is Kabbalah? It is a subject so mysterious that for centuries, only married men over the age of 40 were allowed to study it. That view is no longer universally held. Today, both men and women of any age studied the basic principles of Kabbalah. As one Kabbalist wrote from the 1540 onward, the most important commandment would be for all to study the Kabbalah in public, both old and young. The term Kabbalah refers to the mystical tradition of Judaism. No one knows exactly when Kabbalah first began as the body of knowledge. It sprang from mysticism, but was not a continuation of any known mystical tradition. And it reminds me so much of hoodoo. When when you when you if you're a hoodoo practitioner, you go to Psalms a lot. There's a lot of mystic. I can see a lot of similarities with hoodoo and Kabbalah. It's such a mystical thing. It's really tapping into your psyche, your consciousness. Uh, that's why I tell you, psychology is the most important thing. When you're opening up your spiritual, you opening up to spirituality because you need to know your thinking and you need to know your emotional state. Okay. Jewish mystical practice can be traced back to around the first century BC, and the movement known, movement known as Kabbalah first emerged around the 1200 in Province France. But some Kabbalists say that the first Kab Kab Kabbalistic Revelations dated back to the time of Adam. Although the teachings of Kabbalah are highly mystical, they are also highly practical. Just like who do you know? It's the same. You know, you can see this stretching all the way back. Uh, and I talk about that too when I talk about Obeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of connected because this these are things that our ancestors practiced. This inner power that they had they had activated within themselves. Uh, and you're talking about primordial people. So they were born with a certain type of energy that they knew how to already work with. And so this this comes this goes all the way back, um, you know, beyond time. It, it goes way back in time. Jewish mystics receive revelations about the creation of the universe that are strikingly similar to the modern science Big Bang Theory. They came up with came up with the language and symbology to describe the qualities of God, our relationship to God, our spiritual purpose in life, and the origins of evil. Most importantly, Kabbalists developed an understanding of mysteries of God that can help us unlock the spiritual power, the power that God endowed us with from the beginning, the power that launched the Big Bang. How can we use the keys of Kabbalah to access that power? By becoming mystics ourselves. Yes, we have the right to become mystics in our own time using the map that Kabbalists have left us. The hallmark of Kabbalah is its diagram of the ten sifrit or aspects of God, God, which Kabbalists call the tree of life. It is the blueprint not only for the inner workings. See, this is go back to shadow work. I mean, I, I work with this all the time when I read for people because what I'm doing is removing blocks that you don't see. In your psychology and then shifting you to see from a different perspective, which means that I'm removing a block. And much times when people have a reading, they feel if you have a good reader, 
if, if, you know, if they're knowledgeable, they're able to shift your consciousness, therefore making you feel lighter when you leave, because now you have a new perspective on things. I, I hear that in my class all the time. Oh, I feel so much better since I have my reading. Yeah, because now we shift you, we shift your consciousness, we remove blocks, and now you can actually see from a higher perspective now, you know. So doing that inner work and, and getting a reading and looking at the shadow self, once you start doing the shadow self, you start coming in contact with your higher self because you start looking at things from a higher, a higher perspective. Okay? For Kabbalah teaches that the tree of life is inside of you. It is the link between you and God. You can reconnect with the tree of life of the Sifrit through your specific prayers, meditation, spiritual practice. This outlines some of the techniques. It also shares the insights of enlightened spiritual beings of the East and West known as Ascended Masters, especially the insights of the Ascended Masters El Mora. Okay? It was something else I wanted to read. Is that it? Okay, so you have to get into your psychology. Uh, you have to know your thinking. Okay, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and this book talk, uh, talks about it. Okay, what did I find interesting here? I have it marked. So I'm going to read it. I think it's from the first chapter. No, it's from the third chapter. And this is the tree of life. I'm going to show you because it's got some good pictures in here. This is the tree of life. Okay. And see, when I do the middle pillar, you'll see the word pillar right here. This is the middle pillar I do. Okay. And when I do the lesser banishing ritual, it's dealing with all these other cifras on the side. When I do the lesser banishing ritual. And then I do the middle pillar. To center myself. All these chakras. The chakras become activated. And then when I do the less abandoning ritual. All these other energies become activated around me. Okay. That's why I say. You know. Get into that lesser abandoning ritual. The middle pillar exercise. To really to start bringing in that sound therapy. Start saying it. To start activating the cells. And things in your body. You need to start opening them up. So we're talking about every cell in your body because the uh, most of our body is made of water. So you're starting to really, um, uh, what I'm trying to say, um, lift your vibration, go into a high vibration when you start making all these sounds and pronouncing uh, some of the names in the lesser banishing ritual and some of the names in the middle pillar exercise. You start activating those primordial energies within you. Okay, I hope that made sense. Okay, so I'm going to the third uh, chapter. The name of this chapter is The Tree of Life, The Sifrit Unveiled. Okay, so I had some stuff marked here. I don't know why I marked this. Okay, yes, I do. Okay, so this is page 43. In the opening chapter of, of his gospel, John wrote that the word was made of flesh and dwelt among us. Again, he bore witness that the Son of God... The Tefrit. And I talked about this in my Christ Consciousness book. Christ is not a person. Never was not to be taken literal like that. Okay? This is a consciousness. This is a higher consciousness. A consciousness of service. A consciousness of oneness. A universal consciousness. A, a realization of true self. Uh, that's what the uh, uh, that's what Christ really was. That's what this that's talking about. And and every uh, what I'm trying to say in every age, there's a shift in consciousness, and we're going we, we're we're in this Aquarian age now where we have all this information about spirituality, you know, and so our minds are shifting to a higher consciousness just with this information. Okay, um, the Tifrit, the universe of Christ dwell bodily in Jesus' human frame just as it dwell, will dwell bodily in your human frame when you have mastered the ten powers of the ten Sifrits. Okay, these are power, these are energies within you, around you. Throughout his soul incarnation, spiritual initiations, Jesus fully realized in the flesh the state of being that is Tifrit which is the heart 
uh, we talk, they talk a little bit more about the Sifra. So when you get really start to um, read this book, uh, Jesus fully realized in the flesh, the state of being is that is Tefret. Furthermore, he fully embodied the principles of the surrounding nine Sifra's. As the apostle Paul wrote of Jesus in him, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He who fully internalizes the Tefret and the other nine Sifra's is called the Son of God with the uppercase. He is also called the Messiah, a Messiah, or Christ, which meaning anointed. A Messiah or Christ is one who is anointed with the ten lights of the ten Sifra. Okay? He is then the tree of life. So this is why they call him the tree of life. Okay? And you see how that makes sense because he was studying this this higher spiritual science, this spiritual mysticism. Um, whoever this person was, you know, they say he's real. I, I have to really, uh, you know, I have to really, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I have mixed feelings about that. But I'm just saying that that we're not going to even say this, this person. Uh, when a person opens up these energies, they become Christ-like. They have reached their Christ state. And that's the state that we're trying to get to. Okay? So I like I like that reading as well. Uh, and, and they go in into it a little again. Uh, and I wrote about this in my book, Christ Consciousness. And she talked about this in this book. Uh, and I, that was amazing too. I was like, I wrote, I wrote about this, and here she is talking about it. And I, I didn't even remember this being in the book, but it gave me so much insight how much stuff I have really, really learned on my path, and how I'm learning and developing. It says, uh, while there are other sons of God in heaven, we can call all claim a special relationship to Jesus Christ because He and the archetypal Christ or Avatar, okay. So again, this is an archetype. You know, they made this archetype a real person. That's what they did. Okay? They made this archetype a real person. But these are archetypes in our conscience. You heard it there. So you can't make Jesus a real person and then say we have a Christ uh, archetype. You know, um, it is, you know, it, again, this is an archetype. And you'll see those archetypes throughout the Bible when you're looking at Abraham and, and, and all those other people. These You discover the more you read the Bible, these are archetypes. These are states of consciousness. This is a sort of consciousness that's coming in. I hope that made sense to you. A, or Avatar for the first 2150 year period known as the Age of Pisces. And that's what uh, that individual represents. That's what Jesus is a, a personification of the Piscean age. That's why you'll see those two fish being represented by the Christian Christians, or you'll see a fish being represented by the Christians, and they have no idea that they that you know a lot of them talk about New Age in a bad way, or talk about. Um, spiritualists in a bad way but they themselves are adopting some of this stuff because they sometimes they represent their religion with the fish and that's representing the, um the piscean age as well yes okay approximately every tw uh, 21 2100 years the earth passes through an age corresponding to one of the 12 signs of the zodiac i talked about that in my christ consciousness book the length of an age is determined by the phenomenon called precession of the equinoxes which is the result of the slow backward rotation of earth around its polar axis this backward rotation moves the point of the spring equinox back backwards through the 12 signs of the zodiac a new age begins when the point of the spring equinox moves from one sign of the zodiac to the other during each age a civilization or a con continent or entire planet is destined to assimilate a certain attribute of god See, this country, this energy is always being given to us to help us evolve. How, you know, that, that makes you think how some people are so smart they can build a computer. 
They can build certain things. They have this. That's because this consciousness is being released to us all the time to help us evolve. How humans are evolving right now. We're always having these. Uh, how my high, high power, how the angels, my you know ancestors explained to me. There are little molecules, particles. You can't even see them with the naked eye. Uh, that's another reason why they spray these chemtrails because they don't want us to get hold of these evolutionary molecules because it causes us to advance in knowledge in our thinking. And uh, you know, I, let me get out my soapbox because I'm about to take this another direction. But yeah, that's that's what's happening here. Um, so we really supposed to be more evolved in this, but because they keep so many distractions going on and because they got these chemtrails going on, we can't evolve, you know, as, as on the state that we should be on, you know, some of us are evolving. It's getting a little quicker and time is speeding up. If you can feel it, time is really speeding up. And so a lot of us are starting to get a lot of this stuff as the information is pouring everywhere right now. We're starting to evolve a little more quicker. Okay, let me go on. Now, I thought this was interesting. Let me read this. I got to read this paragraph. This might be a long book review, you guys, because there's so much juicy stuff in here that jumped out at me. And I was like, oh, 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 I read about that. I got to share that with them. Uh, during the age of civilization or, or continent or the entire planet is destined to assimilate to a certain attribute of God. I read that. In about 200 BC or 4,000 years ago, we entered the age. Listen to this. Now, you heard me talk about the patriarchs and the matriarchs. I wrote about that in my book, too. It's somehow the ancestors be, uh, may, you know, um, they really... Um, they really moved me to go back and get this book and, and, and it confirmed a lot of things they said, you know, that I missed in this book when I first started reading it. So, the if, uh, you know, it just shows me the ancestors had already been working with, working with me. We entered the age of Aries. I read, I, I wrote about this in my book, The Ram. The age of the Ram is when the patriarchs and that you'll see that, um, you'll see that in the Bible too. When you start seeing that when Cain killed Abel and men went into hunting and things like that, that's when the patriarchs took over. That's when the killing and, and genocide and all that stuff began. Okay? This was the age of the patriarchs and the prophets. The age of Aries brought the awareness of God as the father. I thought that was interesting. As the lawgiver, about 2,150 years ago, we entered the age of Pisces. The Piscean age brought the awareness of God as the sun and was marked by the coming of Jesus Christ as a representation of the sun, Tephra. Today, we are entering a new age. It is the age of Aquarius. This is the age that we're in. So just drowning in information. Uh, this age will be marked by universal awareness of the Holy Spirit and the Divine Mother. She coming back. See what I'm saying? You see, go back and watch my video, you guys. Go back and watch my videos. As we assimilate the initiation of the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Divine Mother, because that's where all this comes from. That's where all this, even the tree of life, it comes from the Divine Mother. We saw that in this book. Okay, remember I did a book review on this book? Okay, what's the name of this book? The Atmara Illumination, Volume 1. Remember me doing a book review on this, you guys. And they talk about the Tree of Life in this book, too. They, this Tree of Life thing goes all the way back to Kemet, way before Kemet, before the patriarchs even came uh, on the scene. Women were already doing this. They were connecting with the Tree of Life. They were the Tree of Life. Okay? So, uh, just as we had the opportunity to embody the law of the Father and the Son in the preceding two ages, and that really knocked everything out of order. Uh, that patriarch, when they came in and developed their own perspective, because this, again, we're talking about consciousness. We're talking about psychology. This God that they came in contact, uh, contact with, and I get a little deeper with that. I'm trying not, I'm trying to stick to this book review, but I, I'll go into a, a discussion and I, I'm not trying to, but it really shifts some things. And I, this, this book, 
It really, when I read it again, it just really opened my eyes again. Out of all the sons of heaven, God chose Jesus in the incarnate on earth to be the avatar of the Piscean age. Mm. In this road, Jesus was born the weight of the sins of negative karma. And again, this is scapegoating. You know, when I look at Jesus and I look at my life and I look at scapegoats all around, really Jesus became a world scapegoat to this God that they created that was a narcissist. That's just the way I look at it, y'all. He was a scapegoat. They blamed him. He did nothing but good. But yet he was killed for his good. And that's what narcissists do to empaths or scapegoats. Okay, so, you know, when I looked at this, I'm looking at it from fresh eyes, uh, new eyes now, and then being educated on psychology and all types of psychological disorders that, mess, that messes with our spiritual growth. And so looking at another, and when if you're looking at this God and how displeased he is, this God that they created, this God, surely this God is not like that, you know. But these are the spiritual concepts that they come up with and made this God a narcissist to kill this Jesus. And so you're seeing this play out um, throughout the planet everywhere. You know, the, the truth teller always get killed. Can't, it cannot be a true authentic person in this world to stand up to injustice because they won't they don't live too long okay you see you, you again you see these these roles being played out and so the goal is to get out of these roles he has shielded us from the full consequences misdeeds nevertheless we are still responsible to atone for our sin and karma so he really died for nothing you killed him so you didn't really have to look at yourself. The same thing with the scapegoat. The scapegoat is made the scapegoat so the family don't have to look at their dysfunction. So you killed this supposedly Jesus so you didn't have to look at your own dysfunction. You making him responsible. He's just your emotional, spiritual garbage can you just pour stuff into. And this is how they do a scapegoat. I'm just keeping it real with you people. I'm just keeping it real with you. When you start looking at it with fresh eyes, uh, with new insight, you know, uh, um, like I said, I don't want to keep you long. Oh, I wanted to read this because this is backing up what I said too. You know, this is backing up what I said about this, this patriarchal guy. And she goes into this a little bit more when she talks about this, this, God that uh, these patriarchs created. Uh, I like what Zohar says here when he talks about the Tifra and the Shekinah spirit because in the Jewish mysticism Shekinah is the feminine uh, aspect of God. Okay, they're bringing her in. That's the only way they connect. I mean, if your God was just that powerful you know, if this God that you created was just this powerful why do you, it is that it's imperative that you connect with the tree of life to gain those spiritual aspects. And, the, and the, in these spiritual aspects in the tree of life, you're connected with feminine energy. So you mean your God can't individually, you know what I'm saying? I hope that ain't over your head. You still have to come back to the roots of where you got this from, these spiritual concepts from that some of them are intrusive, invasive, uh, abusive. You still have to come back to the roots to get your nurturing, to get your growth. You still got to go back to the feminine goddess energy to gain that growth. Okay? So let me go in here <clears throat> and talk about this. I'm going to try not to keep you long, but like, I got one more thing to read and then I'm going to let y'all guys go. I'm, I'm sorry this is a long video, but this is a uh, some things that I wanted to talk about in this book I thought that was very insightful to me. Uh, Kabbalistic texts depict the disruption of the union of the Tefri, which is the heart chakra, uh, I think, in the uh, Sifrits, because there's 10 Sifrits. And Shekana, Sh yeah, Shekana, as nothing short of cosmic catastrophe. For their separation has has stopped the flow of the divine forces into the world. Now see, when they made this, this man God, when they made this man God, they cut themselves off. Just like I told you, uh, the Jews called themselves, um, 
Hebrews mean break away. You broke away. You broke away. What did you break away from? I talked about that in the other book review. And here he is saying it again on a spiritual level. What did you break away from? Remember when they was out there uh, worshiping that bull or whatever. And they had to. They couldn't even talk to their God or whatever. Moses had to talk to God for it, for them. What had they did? And they talked about that too because Moses was connected uh, to the Sifri, to the tree of life, to this feminine God. They talked about that a little bit in this book too. Which tripped me out. I was like, oh gosh, you know, the ancestors are going to be working with me, giving me this knowledge. I just, I, oh my gosh, it's just confirming a lot of things that Spirit has shared with me. Uh, you know, so they broke away. That means they broke away from, from their mother, goddess, to create this new thing. Because remember, God was so mad with them that he didn't even want to talk to them. Moses had to be talk, talk to God because he was trained in the arts. Okay? I hope this making sense to you. I hope I'm not losing you guys. Uh, but I can, I, can, I can give a better book review on it now because I have more knowledge of of what this person is talking about. As I noted earlier, these forces flow from the inside through the sifrit down into this world. The sifrits are the barriers of the inside. Active creative force, right, Shalom. Maku Shikana is the last sifra to conduct the force to our world. But ever since her exile, you hear that? Ever since her they rebuked her. They blocked her out, the goddess, the feminine aspect of God. You're hearing it here. Okay, this is nothing that I'm making it up. You're, you're seeing it from this aspect. You're hearing it from this aspect uh, spoken in from a spiritual point of view. And you, you're hearing it here. It's confirming everything that exiled her. Remember, I go back again. These people could talk to their God. Most had talked to their God. They got, that God was mad at them. You know, study the scriptures, study the scriptures, because, you know, when you study history and you start reading about the spiritual sciences and you go back and look at the scripture, it will make so much sense to you that there's something else going. There's some more backdrop stuff going on in that Bible that we have not been educated to see. OK, and once you educate yourself to see, you'll start seeing like, oh, my gosh, like it's right here. I didn't see it. It was hiding in plain sight. But ever since her exile, she has been cut off from her constant union with the upper forces that she was supposed to carry and transmit to creation. Looking at some of these women today, looking at some of our mothers today, uh, the conditions that women are up under. You know, we value by our bodies, not not so much by our minds. The state of women. Look at human trafficking that's going on now. You know. Uh, you look at some of this stuff and you like something is out of balance here. The Zohar describes the results of the cosmic imbalance. He says it right here. When Shekinah went into exile, all wept and composed dirges and lamentations. And just as she suffered a change from her earlier state, so too her husband, Tifrit. His light no longer shone from the day that the temple was destroyed. The heavens did not shine with their customary light. The secret of the matter is the blessings reside only in the place where male and female are together. Okay? And they separated that. They had that at first. That, that was there at first until they separated that because of, you know, I don't know what happened between the man and the, I wasn't born during that time, so I don't know. Um, but what I feel like it was is that man wanted to do saw another um, dream for humans. They had another goal for humans than women did, and there was a power shift. You know, there was some sort of power shift between man and woman. With the exile of the feminine aspect of God, the floodgates of heaven have literally been stopped. You hear it? Has literally been stopped. Only a tiny remnant of flow of divine forces from the Sifrit is able to seep through the order to sustain this world. We go back to this energy that's supposed to be coming in here. If they're stopping from coming in here, it's all making sense. 
Okay, you guys all making sense. Shekana begs to be re reunited with her beloved. For when she is, says Zohar, large numbers of righteous come into their sacred inheritance and a multitude of blessings are bestowed upon the world. Okay, so I thought that was very interesting. That was a very interesting read to me. Uh, and I'm going to read one more thing and I'm going to close this, this book review out. Uh, what is this about? Oh, I thought this was interesting because he they talk about this prime this primordial Adam, the primordial Adam. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, all sorts of insights start to pop up in my mind when I was reading this because uh, I've learned so much, and Spirit is always sharing stuff with me as I'm reading. Uh, Spirit is speaking to me. Uh, when I'm reading this, so I always have to come here and share what not only the book, but also what the spirit has shared with me during uh, my reading as well. My little cliff notes, as I, you know, if you want to call it that. Luria teaches that the catastrophe of the breaking of the vessels, nothing has remained in its proper place. Everything is somewhere else, says Shalom. Since the primordial act, all be being has been in exile, in need of led back and redeemed. As David Bio writes, Tazizim and the breaking of the vessel can be seen as two stages in the same process where God is shattered and parts of him are exiled from the rest. Following the breaking of the vessel, the Sifrit reorganize themselves in an attempt to restore their original harmony. See, this, this is where I think Again, we talked about this Jordan boss because when these Hebrews broke away from their feminine aspect, not only was they literally breaking away, they were breaking away parts of them old spirits because you are, we are our ancestors. There's no way to break away from that without hurting yourself. We are each other. We're reflections of each other. So, uh, and then creating this God you know, with a broken person creating this God, these God, you know, as sure it, it was going to be this, it was going to be, um, it was going to be dysfunction, dysfunctional and defective. And that's what happened when, when they, they became defective with that, uh, because they wanted to keep power. They wanted to control the power. Okay. And the only way to do that is to be, uh, defective and uh, dysfunctional and that was injected into most of the patriarch religions want women to shut up be quiet don't say nothing uh -uh, you can't do this you unclean and all this stuff okay I'm just keeping it real with you guys that's how it was that's how it is in most patriarch religions following the breaking of the vessels the Sifrit reorganized themselves in an attempt to restore their original harmony but by our rights, in place of Adam Kadam, the primordial man out of which animated the original Sifri, a series of faces, parts of him, constitute the divine realm of Luria, suggests that the Sifri, excuse me, Sifri system described in the earlier Kabbalah does not exist in its ideal form after the breaking of the vessel. In general, the whole order of creation is demoted to a lower level as a result of the breaking of the vessels. Okay, it's just low morale. You know, uh, we're, we're living, we, we're not getting past uh, the third dimensional thinking. We're not ascending in our thinking. We should be up in our fourth and fifth dimension, you know, by now. Some of us in our sixth dimensional thinking, but we don't make it past the survival thinking. You and you've been, we've been made to be like that. You know, with all the music, all the movies that they promote is made to keep us on a lower level of consciousness, not to think beyond that. Lareel says the first man, Adam, had the opportunity to completely separate the sparks from the, from the shells and set the world back in order because his body was the microcosm of Adam Kadam, but he failed. In Lareel's scheme, Adam's sin was not the or origin of sin. His sin was second fall that repeatedly 
repeated and reinforced the original catastrophe, the breaking of the vessel that had given birth to evil. You hear it there. So when he broke away, you know, he gave birth to evil. Again, you have to have this dysfunctional, defective thinking. You have to have be having some type of obsession with power. Okay? Adam was the nature of purely spiritual figure, a great soul. And he was in his original state. Okay? Whose very body was spiritual substance and ethereal body or body of life. The soul of Adam was composed of all the worlds and was distinct, d destined to uplift and re reintegrate all the sparks of holiness that were left in the shells or husk. His garment was of spiritual ether and it contained within it all the souls of human race in perfect condition. Had Adam fulfilled his mission through the spiritual works which he was capable, which called the com contemplative action and deep meditation, the power of evil, again, the power. We're going to go back to the power because there was obsession with power with this. The power of evil or the calipa would have undergone complete separation from the holiness. Instead of uplifting everything, however, he caused it to fall even further. As a result, Adam assumed a material body. Okay. And let, let me break that down for you. He got... He was overcome with material things. He wanted to have power and dominion. Okay? So let me break that down for you. First, he was living on a higher consciousness and could see how he was always connected. This is how he was when he was connected to the feminine goddess energy. But when he got corrupted by power, it became defective and evil. Okay, I hope this is making sense to you because I'm breaking down, breaking this down for you as best as I can. His soul shattered its unity, was smashed into pieces. The buck of the souls that were in Adam fell from him and were subjugated by the Kelly pot. That's what it says. In a manner of speaking, Adam's fall when he sinned was a repetition of of the catastrophe of the breaking of the vessels. Each sin of man repeats the primordial events in part just as a good deed contri contributes to the oncoming of a banished soul. So I'm going to stop right there. There's more juicy stuff in this book. Uh, I do recommend the book. You know, if you've read a few books, you know, I do recommend it. I do recommend the book. And if you're interested in working with your chakras, like in the back here, it has some great stuff uh, dealing with the chakras, prayers for the chakras to keep your chakras charged as well. Opening up those energy fields. And I think this is a great book for people that, you know, if you're doing a transition out of Christianity uh, into more of a spiritual lifestyle, you're, you're stepping out religion and you just say, no, I want to grow my spirit. This is a great book for that. You know, this is a, a, a prayer, uh, you know, a prayer to Adonai. Again, when you're calling on these divine names of God, you're also opening up these energy centers around you, too, and calling these energies within your space. Okay? Uh, and, you know, yes, I recommend the book, uh, but do read it with discretion. I, I, I highly suggest that you read it with some discretion. And that if you've done a lot of history book, if you read, if you've uh, saw a lot of my book reviews, then yes, I do recommend the book to you. I think I got this book from Thrift Books. Uh, it's a used book, so I think I didn't pay over ten bu bucks for this book. I think it was about ten bucks. So yeah, uh, I hope you found this book review insightful. I hope it's very informative. I thank you so much, loved ones, for being here with me today and allowing me to share my insights and my perspective on the book. Uh, and I'll be doing another book review soon. I think I'm going to be talking about 
more about meditation uh, practices. Uh, I think I'm going to be talking about astral projection. That's going to be an interesting topic that I'm going to, that's not my next topic I'm going to be talking about. So I'll see you there. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button so you can see our next books review. Thanks for being here today. Light, love, namaste. May the ancestors be with you, loved ones.